Lights, camera, action. Welcome to Conversations with Charlie. Today's guest is Mitchell Lichtenstein, director, actor, writer, producer uh, extraordinaire. Let, let's, uh, let's get started and find out what, you, what are you up to right now during this period of isolation? Where are you right now? I'm at home in Park Slope. Where are you? Uh, I am at home in Maine. Oh, lovely. Uh, so not, uh, you know, not very easy to socially distance because there's no one around. <laughs> ah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's, um, I am kind of embarrassed to say that I, being up here has not affected. I do, I'm doing exactly what I would be doing otherwise. So, right. Uh, personally, I'm not affected, but I have, um, a few friends in a sort of guest quarters, uh, who came up from New York, who, <clears throat> um, were presumably, uh, COVID, uh, and they have been there for now five weeks and all seems to be well. They, they their symptoms were very mild. And, um, so I think they have recovered well. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's interesting for the people that I've known that have, uh, 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 that have, uh, have exited the uh, or, or urban uh, mess of, of COVID uh, uh, that uh, uh, other than uh, uh, um, some of the, the rules of perhaps restaurants or bars closing, I would guess, and stuff like that, yeah. has really not changed for what your day-to-day is at home and in, in, in nature and, and, uh, and your daily routine, really, for that matter. Yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, of course, you know, the grocery stores are taking precautions and letting, you know, only a certain people, amount of people in at a time and all that, luckily. So, yeah, they're taking it seriously. Yeah. So, um, take me back uh, uh, to, to, to growing up in, in New Jersey. Uh, this is long before your 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 life at Bennington, and then on into your professional life. What was it like uh, in your home with your uh, uh, with your mom and 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 with your dad growing up and 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 uh, living? I think you started not in Princeton; you were in another town in New Jersey before that, correct? Yeah, um, or in Ohio, actually, in reality, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, born in Ohio. Um, I don't, my, we, the family moved before I was old enough to have any memories of that. Uh, so the first memories are really in uh, Highland Park, New Jersey, which is, uh, it's near Rutgers and Douglas Colleges where my father was teaching and that's why we were living there. Uh, um, and it, um, I, you know, I, it's hard to, hard to, I don't have a, oh, I mean, is there a to, but, was there any foundation growing up with your, uh, 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 with, with what, uh, was there any seed for your, perhaps for your passion uh, uh, to become a filmmaker, an actor, uh, 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 and a theater artist, and, a, and a, a screenwriter, and a director, ultimately? Were there any seeds of this when you were growing up in Highland Park with your mom, and, and then... Uh, I believe you, you said your your father moved into the city after your parents got divorced and you would go to see him there. But what was your life like growing up in terms of the sort of the foundation in a sense of mm. of your the beginning of your journey and wanting perhaps to be a storyteller and wanting to be an actor and how did how did those wheels turn growing up as a kid? Well, I don't know that uh, specifically what I wound up doing was um I was influenced about what I specifically went into, but I, but growing my, both my mother and father were artists, and it was um, you know and they, their friends were artists, and so I grew up assume not assuming that I would be an artist of some some kind, but um, but it was an but it was a natural way of life, so it isn't unusual that um, that I would have chosen something in the arts. Uh, um, but my mother was, um, she had been a decorator in Ohio, uh, and then she really had to give it up because my father wasn't working. He didn't, he didn't have a job. He was wound up sort of hanging drapes for her, uh, for her business. 
and then he got teaching jobs somewhere else and she had to decide whether to, you know, continue her career in Ohio or, or follow my father and her kids, you know, or whatever to, um, and she chose that, which was a pretty, you know, common, but unfortunate, um, thing for women in those days. So. Right on. And, and, yeah. and as a kid, uh, 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 once again, I know obviously you had, you grew up around artists, but were, were your interests seeded in any specific way? Did you, I've never asked you actually in your life if you've, if, if you've taken up, uh, 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 in addition to writing and acting, did you ever take up uh, on the side doing any painting of your own? Were you, is this something that you've also done? What other, what other explorations have you done in your life uh, with your creative side? Uh, my father encouraged us to paint, draw and paint and um, would, I would, he would sort of give us lessons. I can't remember if, if, if it was his idea or if I encouraged him to give, give me lessons, but he did do that and he was encouraging. I never felt any big affinity to that though. So I never really, I never pursued it in any serious way. Um, but I loved, you know, to watch him paint and he would, he would, let the kids in the studio when we were there to uh, to watch and you know that must as long as we didn't yeah watch. yeah that must have been fascinating yeah. to see the stuff come to life right yeah 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 but you know it was it was normal it was um, it was so yeah. for you it was every day exactly it was just like the regular yeah normal everyday life yeah and uh, uh, so you went to obviously went through your your, your school years. Going back to the, the going back to the passion in movies and being around the arts, was there? I, I, I'm I'm sorry to continue asking the same question, but was there was there any idea in your mind that your that that you had a, a passion or a fashion a fascination for the cinema specifically, or for or or for just theater arts that came from the the years prior to when you went on to attend Bennington College, where clearly that became mm. Uh, a noticeable desire. I I was really, uh, if anything, more into writing. I wrote short stories as a kid and a teenager, and um, so that's sort of what I did more. I can see sort of um, hints of the performing by just sort of I would kind of act out to entertain my mother. So I would sort of act things out. Um, so I guess I had a kind of performing relation relationship with her. Um, you know, she had her, her issues and got it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, no problem. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, uh, just trying to, you know, lay down the, 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 the lower, the, the roots, you know, and then, and then, and then off from high school, uh, in in Princeton, where you finished high school, right? Because that's where you lived until you graduated, right? You lived in the town of Princeton. Uh, yeah, Princeton, and then um, I actually went to uh, Quaker boarding school for high school, so I was living out in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. For oh, okay, so you were in boarding school for your to finish high school. Yeah, got it. Yeah, and, and then and then off to to Bennington College, and you started really at, with a, a desire to study uh, literature before uh, 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 becoming uh, a sort of a, a interested in acting. Is that correct? Sort of rewind the clock. I really back. went because they had a great creative writing department. Uh, and since I was writing short stories and stuff, I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I got immediately waylaid into acting. I wound up sort of by chance in uh, uh, a teacher named Larry O'Dwyer uh, in his sort of advanced acting class just because the introductory one didn't fit, was either full up or didn't fit the schedule or something. Uh, and I, that was lucky because he was a great teacher and, and great for me and very encouraging. And I, I don't know if I really would have pursued it because as I say, I had no kind of intentional history of wanting to do that. Uh, so if I hadn't had such an uh, inspiring uh, teacher at that point, um, I don't know if I really would have gotten in it because I'd had teachers since then that if they had been my first teacher, I probably would have, you know, run away. So, yeah. so 
it, that makes so much sense, actually. I mean, I remember in university, I mean, I actually was very interested in acting and, and studied uh, as a minor in acting with a, a guy called Raymond Rowe, who's a great theater professor at, at Clark and uh, where I went. And, uh, but I, I agree with you that that inspiration of a, of a, a, a great professor and a, 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 a mentor and also someone yeah. who proposed really great ideas uh, uh, influences the fuel behind wanting to continue on. So you you minored in in acting at Bennington College and majored in in literature. Um, and I think I have. I mean, technically, it's a double major. It's, it's, it's not one's major. not minor and one's not. You just do both. I mean, you both. So. Yeah, yeah I, I actually in 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 I went to such a wacky place that that I had three majors. Uh, uh, at well, you went to Clark. You said I went to Clark. And they in Worcester, Massachusetts. In Worcester, Massachusetts, and they yeah. allowed us to do something called a self-design major back then. And I self-designed uh, a major with a, a psychology professor advisor named Bernard Kaplan, who was a specialist in the study of dreams. And then I had a great visual arts professor, Ted Spagna, and another one called Charles Slatkin and Phil Rosen uh, in, in the film department. And uh, and and uh, uh, and then Raymond Rowe in acting. So I had uh, a, a, a theater advisor, a visual arts advisor, and a psychology advisor yeah. for my for my major. And I wow. wrote a thesis on 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 the study of of dreams. I kept a dream journal, and I made a short hmm. film from the dream journal. And wow. uh, and then my, my photo professor was one of these guys, very interesting guy, Ted Spagna. He was at Harvard and he, he did these photographic studies done with an intervalometer time last camera over the head of, of beds, as well as just places where sleeping took place. It was even, he even did it in the zoo with animals. Hmm. And he took, uh, a series of of photos with clock time stamps through the entire night of sleep. Then he studied with a guy at Harvard who ended up putting uh, a polygraph and electric uh, connectors to the brain and to the hands and to the body of the individual, measuring brain activity during rapid eye movement sleep and when it took place and then visually what took place during the sleep cycle and also the length of the sleep cycle. So one of the things that I learned, sorry to go into this, but it got me to think about my own life. Uh, I learned uh, that the, the REM, the rapid eye movement sleep cycle could last, believe it or not, as long as 90 minutes, which is sort of the typical length of a feature film. Interesting. Huh, right. So, uh, <laughs> so we, 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 we kind of dove in deep into the idea and then also the idea of the necessity of rapid eye movement sleep, as we know, uh, uh, in order to keep yourself psychologically together because you need, you yeah. need to dream. Um, so uh, I studied that. I had an incredible visual arts professor. I kept my hand in theater and I did all three together. So the idea that there's not a major or a minor is very familiar to me. Uh, uh, you, I, I, I had not realized that. I, I knew that a place like Bennington would, would, would have that kind of freedom. I, my, as I mentioned, my daughter went there and studied dance. So I'm, I'm familiar yeah. with school and love, love it. Um, so you were there and you got into the theater what and you said that some of the plays that you acted in were not plays necessarily by famous playwrights but by 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 students who were themselves writing plays for the theater to perform is that correct How'd yeah that sure they you know they're playwriting students uh, uh and directing students and and you know we all were in each other's productions uh and then then there were i guess there were Faculty directed plays as well, um, so it's a whole a whole gamut. Um, like kind of like Yale, which is where I went later. The same thing. There you're right. in student productions, and then there's there's main stage productions, and um, um, yeah, it's. I mean, that's that's the best part of all these places is is you know working with um, your fellow classmates. And, 
Yeah, but you, but but it, it's a very different dynamic when you're working with a director that's interpreting a classic play to a, a theater piece that was written by one of your classmates. I mean, when I studied acting, one of the last plays I did was a writer, Susan Champagne. She she wrote a, a, a wacky play, a one act play with a, a guy that lived in a park and fell in love with a girl that kept showing up at the park and much of it takes place on a bench. And I played the, the guy, the guy that lived, the wacky guy that lived in the park and. And, uh, uh, and there was a, a fellow uh, acting student that played the, the, the girl who was a student that showed up in the park. And there was, no, there was no reference for the history of the body of work of an artist. You know, like I also acted in a Sam Shepard play. Yeah. There you're interpreting something that's from a, a master playwright, you know, a, a, a person who was a, a known playwright. These are, uh, so there is a little bit of a difference between the two. And that's one of the reasons why I was asking that while you were at Bennington, you said you did a lot of stuff that was written by people in the school, maybe at Yale, less so, I don't know. How did that all work? Did you ultimately have to act in things that were done by famous playwrights? Um, at, at Yale, I'd say it's still more student productions because there just are more of them. There's fewer, um, there's fewer productions of, say, a Brecht or something because they take more, you know, they put more money and time into it. So there's fewer of those, but there's always every level of, of, of production. You're doing a first reading of a play, you're doing something at the Yale Cabaret, which is thrown up in five days, and then you're rehearsing something longer. So there's, there's all levels levels which means more quantity and um, and more experience that yeah. and while you were at yale i mean i'm i'm not trying to make this into a a, a colliding with celebrities festival of any type but i but there were i mean i've known of tremendous acting talent that attended there m many of whom stayed friendly with people who were their classmates i mean i even on this show on on my podcast i had uh, uh one of the alums from yale to john Turturro, who went who, who went to the school while you were there were there classmates because this is a place of fertile environment where you would have met people that perhaps after leaving because you went into your professional life as an actor that kind of remained in your world where were who were people were there people that you were attending with that have maybe stayed in your life since uh yeah uh well I made my best friend um, uh, there, a playwright, and I was in, I think, all of his plays there, or most of his plays there, and, and I did a couple uh, in New York when we graduated, but um, he died of AIDS in the early 90s, um, Harry Kandelian. And, and I still have several very good friends from, from Yale still, so. You still continue your relationships with them. Oh yeah, yeah. Did did that did that filter at all into collaborations after after you uh, 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 were out working? Well, with with Harry, yes, uh, we did um, a play at uh, Playwrights Horizons um, called Anteroom, and you acted in that. Yeah, uh, and. What um, I think we did some other play. I can't, you know, that this is all decades, still decades ago. So, um, I think I, I think we did another play together. But, but we were, you know, we were. I read all his, you know, his work as he was writing it, and it was so. It was a collaborate. No, I'm not saying I collaborated in the writing of his plays, but no, no. you know, we were close as far as our, you know, our working together. Right. I mean, it was your uh, your your career starting starting out and and coming yeah. back and 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 what a a, a huge uh, entrance you had with, with the Lords of Discipline uh, and 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 that playing that getting that role as a first uh, first out film role. Correct. That was my first job out of uh, out of Yale. It was um, incredible. Uh, yeah, it was great. Um, it was a great introduction to just being on a movie set and uh, 
I had been in a movie on a movie set um, some years before. Uh, I was a gopher for Don Avildsen on Rocky. <laughs> so that's fantastic. <laughs> Tell me about that. How did that happen? I was working as um, a cook and a caterer in out in Sagaponic in Long Island, and um, and one of the owners of the shop um, was dating John Alberton. And, he, uh, you know, I, we were talking and I said, I was at Bennington, as you know, has, has winters are the non, non-resident term. Uh, right. And I told him that, well, I have, I have these couple few months off. If you, if I can do anything, if I need anything, if you need anything, let me know. And he actually wrote, said he use a gopher. So I went out to LA, um, and you know, picked up his dry cleaning, and, and um, but I was able to hang out on sets. If I was if I was a more um, outgoing type, I would have probably learned a lot more on in those you know those couple of months. But I was very you know I'm kind of reticent, so I didn't really make the most of it as a real go getter would have. But um, but it was still uh, an eye opening. I open experience. Yeah. And uh, um, I, not that it matters, but did Bennington give you credit for it? I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my member, my daughter went through that every year between semesters. So you guys have yeah. that long stretch after the semester before the second semester begins. Yeah. 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 Um, wonderful. And uh, <laughs> what was it like uh, uh, working with? Um, with uh, 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 with Frank Rodham on on Lords of Discipline and and I, I believe uh, 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 you know a tr- tremendous cast that you were with as well right Matthew Modine was in it right um, no he was in I worked with him in um, later on sorry an Altman movie called Streamers That's uh, that right. was yes yeah uh, but on, this on, uh, David Keith was in it um, David Keith that's right um, Bill Paxton who we became very friendly. Um, uh, he's great. Um, it uh, it was also new to me. The director was very patient. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about hitting marks or lights or lights or, you know, I would I think I would kind of overdo things because I had really only done theater, <laughs> so I would be a little too big. So, but he was he was patient, and it was it was all on you know we were all in London. Many of us, I think, certainly. Well, it wasn't literally my first time on it, but first time for any length of time. Uh, so it was a great, it was a great time, and and I was, I I was paid more the, on that film than I have ever been paid since it's been gradually, or not even so gradually, <laughs> downhill as far as pay scale. Wow. That was the, that was the only real studio movie I ever was a part of. So started with a bang. Yeah, and then and then you went on, but you went on to work with uh, with with Louis Mal, with Robert Altman, with with uh, Ang Lee. Oh my God! Uh, uh, and and even later on, with 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 uh, 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 much later on, with Joel Schumacher on Flawless. Tell me a little bit. Tell me uh, uh, some anecdotes from your experience of working on uh, streamers with 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 Altman, uh, and which was that was the one that you were with uh, uh, Matthew, right? With uh, yeah. Dreamers. Yeah, tell me about uh, that story. That was really well. All I'm sure all actors love working with Altman, and my reason, main reason, which I, I might be everyone's reason, is you you really feel that he trusts the actor that he's cast. Once he's cast you, he believes you will do everything you will do will serve his movie. So you never feel you always feel this sort of innate support and encouragement and um he especially like sort of you wouldn't this was in the this is david ray play called streamers and you wouldn't think you would necessarily know have any particular connection to my character which was this gay character who's kind of a troubled winds up stirring the pot in this in the in the uh um the narrative this is about these guys, soldiers who are about to be sent off to Vietnam and probably, you know, likely will die. So they're kind of last, um, 
but he would throw out these ideas from off, <laughs> off camera that were just great. And, um, and he was dealing with, with characters that were, were dealing with their, their identity, right, in, in the yeah. military. So this is, you know, being uh, an, a gay identity in the military at the time of this was told was a very dynamic story to tell as well, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but we, you know, we all got very close because it was all in one set and we're all, again, we're on location. Whenever you're on location, you tend to, you know, the, the group tends to cohere more uh, than if you're in your, you know, New York, you're at home or something. Um, trying to think of any, uh, well, I mean, there, matter, was, but, um, there was nothing, if there was anything specific that, that comes to mind, I, uh, that, that's understandable. It's just, to me, it was, you know, uh, the, the, you know, having at least uh, collided with uh, uh, Altman Productions in, in the latter part of my career at Technicolor, uh, um, it was uh, 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 wonderful to see the community that he created with the actors. Yeah. Right. Uh, I would think, I would imagine that uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of, of a communal feeling and a gathering. There were dinners and right. And all yep. that, that was sort yep. of part of his, what he was known for. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we worked with him on Prairie Home Companion towards the very end of his, oh, yeah. his, his, uh, his career, which was a tremendous cast. And, and uh, the other thing that he did that I think was very impressive and I don't know, how it impacted the way, your experience while you were working with him. But my understanding from uh, uh, my study of his work is that he mics everyone in the scene and everybody's audio is coming in available at equivalent level for the mixer to hear and, 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 for the, and to creatively use from all parts of the, the set. I mean, obviously he has the focus scene where they're sh where you're shooting but he 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 would frequently take the opportunity to record uh and to capture distinct audio from all over yeah that's i mean that's how he got his signature sort of many levels of of audio in tracks in the movies i mean he was one thing he was known for was that those layers of of audio uh and another thing that um he was very loose with the camera movement often. Uh, I don't know if it was more in this production because it was all in one set. So, I mean, he, he wouldn't like the entire set and be ready for anyone to go anywhere. But within blocking, you didn't have to stick strictly to, to blocking either at a certain point or really you didn't have to hit a mark. Like I said, you probably couldn't go 50 yards in another direction, but you could go, you know, 10 feet in another thing. So that gave us that gave us a lot of that loosey goosey feeling that he really likes. Uh, and he gave the the DPs. They were two brothers, I think. Um, a lot of leeway as far as picking up detail um, as things happen. Like I think. I, I remember a moment that I'm lying in the cot in the in the bunk bed, and there's a light above, uh, you know, a, a working light uh, above, and I started flicking for the first time, and a take started flicking the light on and off, which I could reach, and the cameraman went up and just focused on that. So you know, he he follows the cameraman would also follow the improvisation of the actors, and. I did some TV, some, you know, a guest thing on a TV show following this. And I had some blocking where I was supposed to hug someone and drop down on my knees. And I did it on a different line and everything stopped. <laughs> everything stopped because I had not done it exactly when. Uh, so I, I had to relearn the lessons of uh, Hollywood after after working with Altman, I was spoiled. And right, right, of course, yeah. Because there was, a, there was a, an open, open arm for spontaneity and improv. Yeah, and I realized that that is really 
specific to Altman and a few others. So. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the, the Louis Malle film Crackers. Tell me more, tell me about that and what that was like. I, I mean, Louis Malle is the director, of course. Uh, uh, I, I salute. I mean, these are, these are, this row of great names you worked with is uh, spectacular. Yeah, uh, this was a uh, version of an Italian movie, Big Deal on Madonna Street. So it's a bunch of bungling crooks. Um, and I don't think, you know, wherever Louis is now, he would mind me saying that I don't think this is his best effort. <laughs> this, it didn't, didn't, didn't turn out so great. But this there's a great cast there. Hot, this was not a career highlight for Louis Ma. Uh, no. Uh, but great, you know, Sean Penn and Christine Baranski and a um, lot, you know, a lot of um, great actors. Um, and and then after that, you you had the chance to work on, on with Ang Lee and the wedding banquet. What a first of all, what a spectacular director, but also what a an iconic uh, project of his, right? Yeah, and this was uh, this was his second Ang's second movie. The first his first film was Pushing Hands, uh, and you know basically no one knew who he was because Pushing Hands didn't. It might have been released in the States, but it wasn't, you know, it was very small. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, honestly, I felt, I probably as an actor felt more relaxed and comfortable doing this part because I thought, oh, this is, this is only, this is going to be played in Chinatown. I'll probably never even have to watch it. So I can just, I don't have to be nervous or, or, you know, I don't have to be uptight because, so it made, it made my performance so much better. I wish I had learned this, uh, you know, 20 years earlier, but, but, um, yeah, that, you know, again, that was a great experience. It was, um, again, all mostly in one location, which, you know, which makes everyone, you know, friendly. And although there was, I was basically the only, um, uh, American, in the cast and the others were from were Chinese and uh, Winston Chow who plays uh, my boyfriend in it uh, he's his English was very good but the others were not so so communication was you know was either slow or just you know smiles <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting experience nonetheless yeah yeah fascinating so and and uh, uh and then you went on to work with emily yi ming liu in in kangaroo man another film i don't know but that was an asian title no yeah uh I, because the wedding banquet did so well in in taiwan uh i they asked me to do another movie there uh and i never i don't know what became of the movie really uh i think I maybe went to, I've been to Taiwan a few times for, for these films. I guess one of them was for, for that film, but um, uh, my biggest mem memory is that I had to have an um, Australian accent. And I, although I got coaching, you know, before doing the part, there was really no one watching, <laughs> watching me and everyone else uh, spoke Mandarin. So, I have no idea how my Australian accent, I'm, I would be afraid to hear it now because uh, there was no one keeping track of it. But uh, Very difficult. Well, you know, you like, you know, you kind of wish there was someone around to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but, you know, I, I mean, I have a lot of Australian friends. So for me, listening to, to them speak, I also have friends who who grew up in in Cape Town and Johannesburg, which is a whole other type of accent. Yeah. And when you think about what an American, first of all, has more exposure to, but it's probably more likely to be able to nail, it'll be a British accent because there's there's uh, more field memory that goes mm. back from from I mean I guess mostly from years of cinema probably. But yeah. Performances, right? Yeah. It's it's uh it's uh, the muscle memory of hearing that over and over again uh, is an enabler to be able to copy and 
duplicated. I'm always impressed by watching uh, some of the great British actors that perform with an American accent and really hold it together. I'm like, they all seem to be flawless. It's so, it's so annoying. Me, right? it's, well. it's, it's amazing, right? Yeah. And, and I also might add some Australian actors that come into America and do the same. And that's a, a quite a stretch, but they do it quite well. Yeah, they have training over there. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. And, uh, um, and I, I am less familiar, once again, with, with your work with, uh, with Joel Schumacher, who I actually know quite well on Flawless. Uh, what was that like? Joel is, uh, Joel is one of the great uh, characters for me. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in all of the New York feature film scene, uh, 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 and I and and uh, uh, just a tremendous uh, presence and an absolutely hilarious individual. Yeah, um, that was just that was a you know very one day part really um, a scene with Philip Seymour Hoffman, and I had met um, Joel years ago. I auditioned for um, was it The Breakfast Club or one of the one of no no he didn't do the breakfast did he do the no that's um john um some sort of brat pack movie okay. um i auditioned for him and, films. i mean he's he had a he has a he has a very interesting variety of of uh of outings as a director. maybe he's saying elmo's fire i think he did say elmo's fire the, yeah the band yeah yeah, yeah. That makes sense. um and then years after that, I was in an acting class in, I was living in LA <clears throat> then, and it was a big class with a well-known teacher and he, he would come, he came and sometimes, and he sought me out there and um, said that, you know, it was, which I never knew it was, you know, it was between me and I don't know if it was Kevin McCarthy or one of, you know, whoever did get the part. And um, he kind of, he would just say that he, you know, he almost cast me in it. And um, we, you know, became friendly over the years since then. And he asked me to do this part and I was very happy to do it. Um, uh, but, you know, it was, I don't remember much about, about the part. It was, it was one day. So. It, was a, it, was, it was a much less intense uh, experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And then in, in TV credits, you were in The Equalizer, Nightingale's Cheers, As the World Turns. I know you said Law and Order. Uh, it doesn't really, uh, I'm not allowed to put that on the list because uh, apparently it's one of the great joke, jokes amongst actors in New York that if you've been in New York long enough, you have to hear it on Law and Order. Pretty much. Um, I did do two Law and Orders and, um, um, you know, I'm a, I always, one was, um, as you know, they often do something sort of a version of what's in the headlines or something. Uh, and so I was basically Andrew Cunanan in, uh, in, in one of them, uh, someone who had gone on a serial killing rampage. Um, and that was fun. And always playing some sleazy or messed up psycho, you know. Fantastic. Well, that's what those shows are about, I mean. Yeah, they've got to have. They have to have a criminal. They got to have cops. Yeah, well, I've never been the cop. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And 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 uh, uh, all this time spent on all the things leading up to to what's been going on, which is these great directorial efforts and and films that you've made from from teeth to uh, uh, a, hap a happy uh, a happy tears and of course uh, Angelica um, what uh, not not to not to digress but for a moment I was just looking at happy tears the other day which I find by the way Demi Moore and Parker Posey um, you know uh, in it was that in that was in Angelica right or was that in uh, happy that tears? was happy tears happy tears right fantastic uh, duo lovely I I thought so. I loved the idea of, you know, pairing the indie queen with who had once been basically the, you know, uh, Hollywood queen. And and they were, I thought they were great together. So. Fantastic. I love, I love, and I, I adore Parker Posey's 
sort of character in all the films that she's played. Sort yeah. of has a tremendous demeanor. Um, one of the things that I noted that I had not like looked back at was the poster of Happy Tears. Kind of looks like a painting from your dad. It is, and that it that, is a painting from your dad. And that painting is called Happy Tears. And it's called, uh, okay, but, so then, then, I'm, then I'm a total idiot and didn't realize that. But, well, you did realize it was like that, yeah. Yeah, um, I, 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 it was clearly, it was a clearly, to me, visually a Roy Lichtenstein. I did not know that it was, uh, it was actually uh, a title uh, of, of, a, of a painting that he did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't intended, I had not intended to use the painting. I mean, the, the title for the movie existed before I thought of actually going as far as using the painting, but then the painting was so striking that I kind of felt I had to use it, so. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, 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 the, it's just, you know, we don't really see things like that, right? Uh, to, in, in, in a, as an emblem for, yeah. uh, for a story. That's, I think it's very powerful. Um, so, let's wind back to teeth because I was around when you were making that. I was still working at Technicolor and yeah. I remember when you approached us and talked about the story. Uh, I, I know the, the, the foundation of, of, of the story and the story elements and I've seen the film. Uh, it's a really twisted movie. It's really twisted. I mean, it's unusual, but it's incredible. Uh, uh, and I don't know your story behind writing that and how this all came about? Uh, well, it's sort of a bit, it's about the myth of the vagina dentata, which is, uh, which I learned about um, through my other mentor at Bennington College, Camille Paglia, uh, studying late 19th century literature, this, uh, the, this myth would come up metaphorically in, um, in this sort of so-called decadent literature of, uh, and that's sort of how I learned about it. And it stuck with me over the years, mainly, to, mainly just about how weird it was that this myth was so pervasive, the more I learned about it, excuse me, the, uh, and in how many cultures it existed in, in various ways. And why the did the myth of a man getting dismembered by a woman's teeth in her vagina? I mean, this is yeah. a, this is you know sort of like the the thought of of the myth of the nightmare of the myth is is uh, uh, is is horror, right? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I just thought it it was very strange that presumably men attributed, came up with this myth and attributed it to women and why was it, why and why was it so pervasive? Uh, and it hadn't really been dealt with directly in a movie. It, again, it has in metaphors like the, in the, especially the second Aliens movie has been interpreted, that monster is interpreted as a vagina dentata figure. It's a female, female monster with big teeth. And, basically any female monster has been interpreted as a sort of metaphor for vagina dentata, which itself is a metaphor, but connected to this, to the, to the myth the, and the story of that. Yeah. 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 But I thought that kind of that remove of not, not saying, not showing the direct, the myth itself, kind of hid the truth that this is something men invented and put onto women. And it kind of perpetuates the myth if you don't kind of bring to light what the ridiculous, the ridiculousness of the, this original myth. So I thought it'd be interesting to deal with it directly and in a kind of uh, tongue in cheek manner that would show that hopefully that I am not trying to perpetuate the myth, but I'm trying to have to bring it to light in a fun and kind of gross out way that will um, hopefully 
take the weight out of <laughs> out of the myth, blow take the air out of take the air out of it, um, while well still having good gross out moments and you know. Oh yeah, but but I uh, we're gonna wind back to the plot because I, I I remember this and the moment by moment. I, I, am I correct? And and, and now I'm I'm I'm. I'm going to have to expose my memory of the film, but one of my memories was that the female character who had the 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 possibility of dismembering, um, what was wishing to be able to not dismember a male, and that perhaps if she fell in love, the teeth would not come out. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, she goes through an arc, um, which is pretty much the same arc for most superheroes that go through. First, they don't know they have the power. Then they kind of suspect they, there's evidence that they do have it, but they don't believe it. Then they realize they do have it and they hate it. They don't know what to do with it and they want, don't want to have it. Uh, then they learn how to use it and they accept it. They learn how to use it to their advantage. That's, that's kind of the arc for Stephen King's Carrie, and uh, most, you know, I think most superheroes. Uh, so she goes to that arc, and uh, she's horrified at first when it happens for the first time, and then she learns, as the movie goes on, that if the sex is something that she wants, the teeth don't come out. And if it's something that she doesn't want, uh, they do. So it's really... Um, um, and then she learns to control it. So even um, so, at the end, she um, gets someone who does deserve this <laughs> uh, into the position where it will happen. So, got it, got it. So yeah, yeah, uh, um, uh, uh, incredible, uh, uh, sort of bizarre but wonderful exploration of this uh, of this. Of this myth, but an incredible film and, and a one of a kind, I might add. I, I don't think that we'll be uh, seeing, uh, uh, we have not seen this uh, b before uh, in any way. No. Well, I hope someone, we're, we're trying to get someone to make a series, uh, series out of it because there's a, uh, we think there's uh, a lot more that our character Don can do. So. Uh, Listen, but, I, I can see that. I can see Netflix or Amazon jumping on on the idea of having a, a woman with teeth in her her vagina. Absolutely. Uh, so far, they haven't, but maybe they. <laughs> it would be yeah. Time for the pitch again. They're yeah. looking for new stuff. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then and then ha Happy Tears came around, and and that was an interesting story. What, what I loved about that was, you know, yeah, the the dynamic of the of the of of the girls and and then the, and it was also there was also the 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 father played by Rip Torn right yeah and and and, and for, first of all Rip Torn uh, oh my god right I mean as an actor fantastic yeah. anyway but and then and then also uh, uh, Ellen Barkin as his I guess it's his kind of sexy lover character mm -hmm. right that's mm -hmm. it's a great it's a fantastic uh, uh series of events and and uh, a great it was a very warm lovely film yeah <laughs> thanks yeah um yeah amazing actors um it um yeah that was kind of inspired by sort of um some distant family members so it's all a lot of it is um based on some distant, not my immediate family, but um, some family in removed. Family in your, in your, in your uh, uh, family tree. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot, a lot of that is pretty much, I, as I learned this stuff that had gone on, um, a lot of that is taken from that. So, um, uh, and I got very enamored of this, that story and wrote <laughs> it. Um, but yeah, what that was a great group of. Um, well, it was great dynamic because he's he's this kind of perfect 
sort of wacky dad figure that that you but very but very uh, very engaging and you know and and lovely yeah yeah i guess i mean he's you know he's he's a terrible father <laughs> i mean but but no, 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 uh, i understand yeah. that but I, yeah. you know what i'm saying is that yeah well yeah. he plays it he it to torn to he knows how to how to be awful and yet engaging and you know winning at the same time so that's what i'm saying yeah 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 he he is his the the way in which he 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 creates that character is uh, uh and your uh way of uh of 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 making that narrative expose itself is beautiful it's just a lovely but yeah obviously he's playing a a a a, a less than ideal father figure for the <laughs> girls yeah <laughs> yeah and then you went on to uh, uh, to make um, uh, Angelica, which is uh, uh, quite ambitious. Tell me about that and how that got born and 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 made. And I know we don't want to talk too much about you know film finance and where the money comes from, but but was that that must have been funded by some equity support, right? I would private, know. private equity, yeah. Private equity. Yeah. Um, that came about because uh, I my. Um, I had an agent uh, at the time, and also with that agency was the author, uh, Arthur Phillips, who had written the novel Angelica. And they were looking for someone to turn it into a movie and gave it to me. And I really loved it and thought, thought I could do something with it. So um, I adapted it. And, um, but it is ambitious because it's period to, it's a period piece and there are some special effects and unlike unlike there are some special effects in happy tears but they're kind of meant to look lame <laughs> because it's kind of filtered through this wacky character's point of view who's you know uh i just wanted it wanted it to be kind of lame and the the dp for happy tears uh jamie anderson was very was a good egg because some of the framing I wanted to look like the most awkward framing of them, really just the last place you would with the camera. And he was nice enough to do that a few times. <laughs> so, uh, um, and anyway, um, but the special effects uh, in Angelica had to look better. <laughs> so, um, so though that was the ambitious part, there was, uh, but um, that was really. Uh, also, it was also um, period. I mean, this is yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of moving parts to this. Yeah. Yeah, that um, mostly in the 1880s, and then there's a sort of a bookends that are 1912, 1913, and luckily, um, my good friend from Yale and brilliant costume designer Rita Ryak. Uh, did the was available to do the costumes and she had never done uh, that period before and she was eager to dive in and she's brilliant. Um, Dick Pope was the DP who's oh Dick Pope I love love amazing uh, and Luciana Arrighi did did uh, production design she was a legend and she, you know did I think her first her first uh, production design was Sunday Bloody Sunday. <laughs> Wow. And uh, then she, she did a lot with that director, and then she did a lot for the um, Merchant Ivory. But uh, she was, I mean, she's great. Like, we, um, Joyce Pierpoline, my producer, found this old decrepit mansion in Yonkers that is now only used for photo shoots and film shoots. And she had the idea that we could film most of our, most of our, interiors there and I looked at I didn't see really how it could be done all I mean you could do I could see some of them but how do you get to make it worth taking over this whole place how do you do them all and we had one uh, we consulted with one production designer who came and said no 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 you can't do this it won't, it won't work blah, blah. then we thought of Luciana who I, I thought was just out of reach I hadn't really even thought we could get her, but she came, you know, immediately saw how we could do this. So 
she was able to put all but I think maybe one a, a pub, which we filmed in London, but otherwise every interior in this one house, and they're quite varied interiors from a from a hotel room in Venice to uh, to a to a London slum to you know all sort of all a big variety of so she being a genius you're, you're, was able to do that creative geography all all of your story components were able to live inside of this house yeah so we didn't you know and it also um proved joyce right once again so i had doubted it but she knew somehow it could happen and she was right um i was gonna say uh don't remember but, uh, well, you were saying that, that you, you did not believe it was possible to do it in this one house, which is to yeah. me completely imaginable because the reality is when I've visited productions that have even so much as a, a home exterior as majestic as the house that you had, they'll, they'll rebuild the entire interior of that house in a large stage Yeah, uh, uh, with, with, uh, silk uh, outside the window with backgrounds to composite and yeah I mean you know you, you would you would never make that attempt to try to utilize an existing structure uh, to be able to shoot every angle and every shot um, and and then from those those stage shoots seamlessly go into this environment and never realize that you're in two different places and here you're it's yeah, first you're all in one place. Yeah, I mean the exterior was of the house of of one of the main locations of the house that the characters live in. Uh, we you know we had an exterior in London, uh, but that was totally seamless going in and you know. Um, but I guess I was going to say that um, another thing that does is save so much time from moving from one to I mean, you know we were on a very tight schedule, and and packing up and moving from one. I'm sure we, you know, we saved many days of, um, from that, so. Uh, and and, from, uh, and, and that's actually a great uh, 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 point for, you know, our, our audience to, 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 to hear about each of these, uh, because, you know, uh, not everyone realizes how many, how, how efficiently things are done, how many days did it take to shoot teeth, happy tears, and Angelica, how were were they all super fast, or did you have more days on one and less on the other? How long did you have to shoot teeth, as an example? I, I don't I don't remember. Teeth, I, I think, was more or less thirty days, something you know, thirty or close to, or a little, maybe a little over, and standard was probably similar. And we had more time. Uh, we had a bit more time with angelica and then we did a we did a separate maybe 10 days uh in london so okay so yeah so you that was a that was a larger uh, undertaking then yeah even though it was done in a very efficient way as you described with using the house to shoot all of the interiors yeah uh and the other um i'm I'll come back to that. I wanted to mention the composer, but I'm <laughs> um, blocking his name, but he's uh, another amazing. Great artist. Yeah. Great, great, great. I yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you know, for me, uh, I'm often fascinated by the way in which directors approach music, original composition from a composer, as well as tracks and and the process that you go through can we talk a little bit about how you approach it and and whether or not in any of your films you have a thought in your mind while you're shooting a scene you 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 have music in mind for 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 the for what you're shooting i don't have music in mind um uh the composer for Anchaka is Svignev Preisner, who is amazing. And, you know, he's known for um, working on with on the Decalogue and uh, um, 
he's amazing. Um, Take the joke, we got it. Um, but he worked, I worked with him quite differently than with Robert Miller, who did the score for both Happy Cheers and Teeth. Uh, uh, Robert is very uh, collaborative and we would really be in together and we'd trying things off the spur that, you know, kind of trying um, many things kind of right in, in together in the room. And Spignev is less, he's collaborative, but less so. He, if he really believes in something and I don't get it, he will really stick to it. Um, and there are times when I just, I didn't get it, but I trusted that he was right. <laughs> and looking back after I see how he was right and how, you know, cause I will get stuck on an idea that his, that maybe his, some track didn't meet, meet my idea for that, but it took me time. I'm, you know, um, I do kind of bow down to those who know better. <laughs> so, well, no, um, I mean, I, I, you know, this is really, this is the discussion in the end, isn't it? About filmmaking. I mean, uh, 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 uh our, it is, uh, 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 a house that gets built by many people. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, the contribution of a production designer, a cinematographer, a composer, um, uh, are, are, are tremendous because they're going to, you know, and, 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 and the way in which, uh, a, a director has, uh, uh, some type of, you know, dream of what it will be and works with people that can, can can comprehend where where they where they want to go i mean it's uh it's it's mm. it's a secondhand language it's not uh it's not all just uh uh a, a, a series of 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 inherent answers it's a discovery process yeah and there are directors you know who just that has to be their way <laughs> and i'm not one of their one of them so yeah, no, 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 there definitely are. I mean, uh, um, I, I, I have uh, memories of being in, in the uh, final moments of, of finishing uh, uh, one of Sidney Lumet's films with, with Ron Fortunato. And the, the joke was, what, whatever anyone else said, it really didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> you know, and when you did something alone, autonomously when you finish the day you said well it doesn't really mean that much because when Sydney comes in it's all going to be done the way he wants and whatever yeah you know we, we we hope we hope we we hope we anticipate and interpret what what the what what he had on his mind and and uh and uh answered the uh the creative challenges the way that he wanted us to yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's interesting the 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 whole process and and going back into uh, your your acting career, which was a combination of film and television. Um, did now, I mean, that's that's a a chunk of time in in your life in your career. Um, is this? Do, do you wish to to continue? that is part of your your journey i haven't seen you uh, uh go back into that if you i mean uh, uh, do you wish to continue to perform or 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 the rest of the for your career to 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 write clearly to write as you do and, and to direct are you pressing yourself in that direction uh, i wouldn't i sometimes i miss acting uh because i i did I did love it, and it is a, it's a more of a single focus than obviously than directing, and it's it's. Um, but I would not be willing to do what I'd have to do to do it. So I'm I'm not I wouldn't be willing to 
um, go spend time in New York when I don't want to be there and I'm waiting for a call or, <laughs> um, so I, 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 you know, maybe if I might someday write apart for myself, but I don't, I would never again, kind of, you know, I'm dedicate yourself to that as in other words, right? Yeah. To the, to the life of what you have to do to do that. So. Right. Right, right, right. Of course, because it's a, uh, it's, it's a, a, a process of, of, of waiting to be called, right? Yeah, and I, I don't, you know, these days I don't spend a lot of time in the city, and I don't want to, uh, unless I'm, if I'm working, of course, uh, I go wherever, but, uh, but I'm not going to, um, you know, sit by the phone and think uh, about that. Yeah. And, and now with, you know, I, I like to think of now in, in our, in our lives in, in, in isolation, even though perhaps it's, as we said before, not that much different in, in the rhythm of your life. Are, are you, do you dedicate a certain amount of your, 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 your daily uh, and weekly ritual to uh, continuing to write? And, and develop stories to do in the future. I'm, I'm imagining that this is something that you're doing, but yes. I can't say I'm awfully disciplined about it. Um, I'm writing a play, which I've never done before, but um, hopefully there will be theater again someday. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, right? I mean, that's a whole other question, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're you know, I just was reading an article a, a day a, ago because I decided to dive into the business news on the chain uh, American Multiplex uh, Corporation, AMC, and of course Regal and and the the big chains, and there's there's trouble in in in, in that world. You know, I mean, I, uh, they're yeah. not operating, and yeah. I, I and I, you know, I I happen to be, you know, I'm one of these whatever, a bit of a romantic. I'm a I'm a cinema lover. Specifically, of all all cinema, not just I, I mean, I, for me, the multiplex is uh, is a place for new content to come through. But I, I'm a big fan of of calendar theaters and repertory theaters that show old movies and 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 curated programs. Yeah, but no matter how you cut it, doesn't matter where it is. People have to gather. Yeah, um, but you know, at least I mean, film. It's of course not the same, but you can, you know, it can be streamed or, you know, but uh, theater when it's streamed is not theater. It's um, it's um, something else. So uh, that there's really no way to replace the experience of the cinema. Yeah, yeah, and I, and yet and yet the uh, uh, the the watching. The viewing, the the uh, audience uh, 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 interest and in, and uh, viewing is at a, and in the streaming world is a, a clearly now at a, an all time high. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the demand for for stories like your what could be your your teeth series is as 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 high as ever. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's. Uh, uh, we uh, the world has shifted, um, and uh, and we all have to adapt to it. I mean, hey, I, uh, up until uh, 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 the the shutdown, I was doing all of these podcasts in a studio in Park Slope. But one of the things that I love about the fact that we're doing them now on Zoom is, if I want to talk to someone like yourself in Maine, you don't have to drive to a little studio in Brooklyn, <laughs> and uh, and if I want to get online with someone in london or australia i just yeah. schedule a call and we've got a show yeah i have a <laughs> friend here who are doing yoga classes with people in australia and it's just you know <laughs> it's like that, right yeah. yeah absolutely the uh, uh there it in a weird kind of way it, it can uh, uh it can in a i guess uh, uh, bring the world together uh in a different way yeah and um uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, uh, 
this has been just a, a great uh, uh, exploration of, of, of your, your life. And I, I really appreciate your, your, your time. And, and, and uh, this has been fantastic, Mitchell. I, I really appreciate talking with you. I mean, I, 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 I hope I covered everything. Did I cover everything? You've covered plenty. <laughs> sure. What, 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 I always want to know what I, did I miss anything? Did we, we didn't talk about, did, we didn't really talk about working on, 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 uh, on the actual episodic shows that you did as much. Oh. You know, they're, they're fun, but they're not, you know, they're, I don't think I have, um, anything fascinating to say about that. Uh, I was just, you know, you were doing, you happy were doing to get work and, yeah. and, you know, Happy for the phone to run. And did you get a chance while you were doing, because it was quite a, a stretch of time before, because it was back and forth, TV, film, TV, film. If you look, you know, in your, in your filmography, you, 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 you went in and out of doing both. During that period of time, there was also a certain amount of theater that was going on too, right? I did, uh, I did some theater, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, when I lived in LA, actually, I... I did wound up doing more, oddly enough, more theater than um, than movies or TV. Uh, there were, at the time, there were a couple of good repertory companies there. Uh, and uh, New York, I only did one play on Broadway. There was a revival of Suddenly Last Summer, Dennis Williams, um, with Elizabeth Ashley, and that was fun. And uh, uh, made very good friends with uh, an actress, Celia Weston, who's great actress and a great person and uh um yeah i love the community of doing of doing theater because that you know there you're really working together for a long time and you, you know um it's different than most films where you don't necessarily even meet many of the other participants so right on yeah and 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 up in like basically for you, when you're removed from the the hustle and the bustle of all of the activity in our industry and up in Maine, you get the chance to, you know, think about what's next. Um, and there are a lot of things that you're developing. Are there any uh, 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 projects that you were hoping to ignite that are finished that you you've done and completed and and uh, and happened before the shutdown? Or are you you're just uh, stirring all the ideas around that you've, you've Yeah, no, there's nothing. I, kind of after Angelica, which came out a couple of years ago, I did not and still don't really feel a strong urge to get back in. I, um, I love to do something, you know, like a work for hire, which I've never done. Um, right, to be hired, really from, right, as a director or, or, or actor, obviously. Uh, really since I started directing with uh, Teeth, I was, I mean, it took some years between each one, but basically I did three movies in a row, even though there's years between them, it was all kind of developing and working on those. So uh, I didn't really, this is the first time I've not been doing something since I, since I started directing. And uh, it's a, it's very rewarding, of course, but it is a heavy lift to initiate project and kind of um generate it and yeah no i mean the whole process your you 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 idea development uh a uh, 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 story script uh uh cast production dates post production i mean oh my god uh, and then with um you know if you're not doing it through um i mean if you haven't sold it ahead of time which we never have um then you know, I'm as the sort of main person, I'm kind of responsible for selling it. And I'm A, not good at it, and B, hate it, <laughs> that aspect of it. So um, right, right, right. You're, not, uh, you're not, you're not good at the, I, well, I think, you know, you're an artist, you know, selling yourself, please. I mean, that's a hard thing to do. This is, this is why there are agents and representatives. I mean, uh, you know, people who talk about you on your behalf rather than uh, you, uh, 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 shining a light on you, right? Would, would you say that that's sort of the mojo? 
Yeah, but you know, yeah, but still, they having the responsibility, even if someone is mediating or something, of of it's being basically my responsibility to get it sold or whatever. And I guess I could change my mind, but right now I don't don't think I would ever put myself in that position again. So um, right, right, no, no, I understand that. Yeah, that that's a very that's a very difficult place to 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 be. You're you're because this is been it's you know your your life was was this project and then you're in this position where it's done and then you're 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 gripped with this uh uh this process which is quite it's quite arduous of selling and even when it goes at its best as it did with teeth where uh, we first screened at sundance and in sort of in the middle of the second screening um I was pulled out of the audience and um, Harvey Weinstein said he wanted to buy it. And so it was, so he, that basically happened in the middle of the screening. Even, and that's sort of a best case scenario, even that wound up being to a degree a nightmare and a disappointment. So, you know, even at its best, it's still, you know, it's a challenging and, um, to some degree, other heartbreaking experience. So. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I hear you a hundred percent, and and understand that because that, uh, and and uh, and and uh, perhaps uh, in a sense, it takes away from the journey. Would you say? Uh, it de- well, it depends on the day when I'm looking back. Which, what do I remember uh, now? Um, I'd say the further back, the less it does. <laughs> the you know teeth, I don't think about the, um, how, you know, how it was actually Weinstein and um, Lionsgate kind of teamed up to buy it. One took the theatrical and one took um, DVD and foreign. And, um, and Lionsgate basically kind of reneged on what they had, you know, the money they promised, what they were going to, and how long they were going to, release it and the money to put in. And I'm sure that, I mean, I know that that's not an uncommon thing to do, but you know, it was my, it was a wake up, a, another wake up call uh, for me, how um, powerless you are in those situations. Uh, and, you know, obviously, well, one reason, one big drawback to be an actor is you are kind of powerless. You're a cog in a cog in a big machine. Um, one thing that made me want to write and direct is that I have um, influence over a much <laughs> larger part of the project. And then that's kind of all taken away at, uh, you know, at the end by, uh, you know, um, you know, a corporation. There you go. There you go. That's a, uh, that's, I think that's a, uh, I think that's a good stopping point actually. <laughs> yeah. because, because it, it, it closes on an idea and a thought to sustain. And I, I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, Mitchell, this is wonderful. Thank I'm you so glad much. Glad you joined and, uh, uh, and tell, uh, uh, all of your friends and 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 uh, uh, and network to subscribe to conversations with Charlie. I will. Thank you so much. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you.